Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the George W. Norris Legislative Chamber for the 46th day of the 108th Legislature Second Session. Our chaplain for the day is Senator Steve Erdman. Please rise. Please join me in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather in this room to make decisions that are important not only to those people here, but those people back home and the people in Nebraska. We pray this morning for all those people that in the clerk's office that prepare for the day, make all those things necessary that we can function and that we can complete our work. We just thank you for the staff that works in this building as well, Lord. Many times we pray for guidance for the senators. Today I ask you to give those people who work here to make us uh, help us accomplish the things we need to. And we also now want to thank you for the greatest season we're entering in the history of the world, and that was when you came to give your life, to shed your blood for the sins of the world and to restore us back to a relationship with you. You came to pay a debt that you did not owe, the debt that we could not pay. We thank you for that. We thank you that you offer that to us as a free gift. And we just pray as we celebrate this resurrection this, Christmas, this Easter, we pray that you would help us to understand that you did that to restore us back in good standing with you. We thank you for the many blessings you've given us to live in this state and this country. We pray now that those things we do today would honor you and you'd be glorified by the things that we do and say. In Jesus' name, amen. I recognize Senator Kauth for the Pledge of Allegiance. And I would like to say happy birthday to my mom who is watching. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I call the order of the 46th day of the 108th legislature, second session. Senators, please record your presence. Roll call.
Mr. Clerk, please record. I have a quorum present, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Are there any corrections for the journal? I have no corrections for the journal. Thank you. Are there any messages, reports, or announcements? I have none at this time. I have none at this time. Senator John Kavanaugh would like to recognize Dr. Sarah Hofschneider of Omaha, who is serving as a physician of the day on behalf of the Nebraska Family and Medical Assistance. Please rise and be greeted by your Nebraska legislature. Mr. Speaker, you are recognized for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. President. So uh, we've all had a, a night to spend considering our last few minutes together last night. And I've thought long and hard about what I want to say this morning after last night's debate. And I ask everyone to listen carefully to all my comments, not just the ones that you initially agree with. And I don't anticipate anyone to agree with all my comments, but I'm asking everyone to actively listen with the goal to understand your colleagues who do not share your views. At the end of my comments, I do have a big ask for all of you, and I hope everyone can carefully consider what is best for the institution. First, I want to apologize to Senator Michaela Cavanaugh, every other member of this body, but especially the female senators. I do not condone the reading of the graphic rape scene on the floor of the legislature, nor do I condone personally directing that passage to another member or members of this legislature, even if it is to make a point. Despite the R-rated warning, we do not know who was on the other side of the television screen watching and listening, certainly children, that this bill is directed to protect, not to mention survivors of sexual assault. I know it upset members of this body, but we cannot dismiss this simply as a public forum and broadcast live across the state of Nebraska. I was off the floor when the passage was read. I was in my office preparing today's agenda, so I did not hear it personally. Had I been on the floor, I hopefully would have learned of the intent to read from that transcript, done everything to prevent that from happening. I was not able to do that. I don't want to minimize this incident, but this is not the first inappropriate incident to occur on this floor. And unfortunately, I have no hope that it will be the last. These things do happen occasionally. However, second, I want, I, I, we cannot let this derail our session, nor can we collectively decide and um, simply that this was inappropriate and move on. Make no mistake, I intend to vote for LB441, but I'm separating my views on the bill from what's appropriate for debate. At the beginning of the session, I asked each of you to reset, and I believe as a legislature we have. I see people working with others, trying to find compromise. Members are working their bills. The tone and tenor of debate has been different this year. We cannot allow this to define the remainder of the session. But I do want to give you my perspective on the remainder of the session, and, and that, is, that is this. We have approximately one half of the priority bills out of 103. There's approximately 54 that sit on general file. Let that sink in for a second, half. So we are no more than half finished with moving and debating um, our priority bills on general file. So here's what I would ask. This is, my, this is my ask. If we are serious about getting this work done and the priority bills that are in front of us, I would ask, number one, that we do not slow walk non-controversial bills. That has occurred this session. I've watched it happen. Some of it has to do with what's coming up on the agenda, and I get it. Um, but, but please do not slow walk non-controversial bills. We don't have the time to do that. We need, if they're non-controversial, we need to have good debate. We need to take our votes. We need to move on. We need to move the bill. Second, I would ask, please do not make everything controversial. And that is, that goes for the proponents and the opponents of the bill. It can come, it can come from, it can come from either side. In other words, there's something in this bill that I really don't like. So take the bill down. So to both the proponents and opponents of bills, I would, I would strongly encourage you, ask you earnestly, work on compromise. Find a way to move the bill, if that's possible, may not be, there are those bills that are not, I get it, 
But if it is possible, seek. Don't just count votes. That happens. Do not just count votes. Work to address opposition. And the last thing I would ask and, and is, is that we all use wisdom in our free speech. We have the right. Doesn't mean we should use the right. Wisdom. That, that is that, that's that ability to use knowledge correctly. We, get, we, gain, we gather a lot of knowledge, hearings, and reading, research, and conversations, and our constituents, and the lobby. We're gaining a lot of knowledge. Now, how do we use that knowledge is the, is the part of wisdom. It, wisdom tempers free speech, especially after 6 p.m. when we're tired, and it takes additional effort for that to happen. So those are my asks. Now, this morning, some people are going to speak, and, um, and we're going to give others opportunity to speak. How it's going to be structured is there's going to be a couple point of personal privilege. Um, Senator DeBoer is going to make a motion to overrule the agenda, the speaker's agenda, which is not a hostile motion. It's, it's something that I think is appropriate. And then if you have a desire, not required, if you, have, if you want to speak, then there, that will be an opportunity for you to speak. So we want to give that opportunity, um, but, but uh, don't need to belabor it. But my ask is that we don't allow last night to define the remainder of our session, that we're able to do the work and uh, continue the good work that we have begun at, at the beginning of this session. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Speaker Arch. Senator Conrad, for what purpose do you rise? Point of personal privilege. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. President, <clears throat> and good morning, colleagues. Um, Mr. President, members of the body, we're responsible for what we say and do in this body. Everyone who got us to this challenging point is responsible and, and accountable. Our words and our actions and our statements matter. We are representatives of the people of Nebraska. We are not here for ourselves or our own personal vanity. We are responsible for what we do here. And I ask each of us as we proceed with debate today to think about how every vote out of committee got us to this point, how every vote on this floor may have gotten us to this point, how every agenda decision contributed to this moment, how every choice and word we make leading up to this point has brought us to this point so that we can lead and move forward together. As a matter of policy, it's important to remember and to note that the Nebraska legislature is the only deliberative body in the state of Nebraska. As elected representatives of the people, we must be free to discuss issues of importance to our constituents and to all Nebraskans as each senator sees fit. Sometimes debate and discussion on challenging and controversial subjects will be difficult. It will be pointed, it will be hostile, it may be offensive, it may be painful, and it may be personal. But we should not avoid contention. We should not move away from conflict. We should not avoid controversy. You don't have to be a First Amendment expert to cherish the First Amendment. It is well grounded in our federal constitution and our state constitution which we all take an oath to uphold. Accountability and responsibility and consequences from a political perspective are different than punishment from a political, practical, policy, and legal perspective. I do not believe that we should support calls for, <clears throat> calls for censorship or expulsion for one of our own, particularly during debate about censorship and punishment. The solution for speech or arguments or proposals that we disagree with is to point that out and to speak in kind, to use our voice on this floor and beyond this august chamber as we see fit. The antidote for speech we find offensive is speech, not punishment, 
not punishment at the hands of government. And colleagues, let me be clear. Popular speech needs no protection. Popular speech no, needs no protection. That's why our civil rights and our civil liberties have long been protected by constitutional prerogatives because unpopular speech is the speech that needs protection. Principles and character only matter if we stand by them when it's most challenging. It's easy to stand by principles from an academic perspective. When those values and principles are tested, it says a lot about who we are and what we stand for if we stand by them in the times of great challenge. I have confidence in our ability as individuals and as a collective to debate contentious issues, even when it's hard, even when it's offensive, even when it becomes personal, because that means standing by our commitment to free expression. We can call out speech we don't like, there can be political debate about that, but it is wrong to invoke governmental punishments for speech that we find offensive. Protecting the right to free speech and free expression does not mean condoning it. That's an important line that we have to be willing to understand uphold and stand along together. If a member thinks that engaging in debate is persuasive or effective, they have the right to do that. They have the right to do that, colleagues. You have the right to call it out and say, you find it insulting or offensive or ineffective. You do not and should not pursue options or opportunities to punish that speech from a political perspective. In addition to the rights and values guaranteed to each of us as Americans, as Nebraskans, as enshrined in our federal and state constitution, there are also specific specific protections enshrined in our state constitution to ensure that legislators and the speech that happens on this floor have the highest protection of the law. Look no further than Article 3, Section 26 of our state constitution, which explicitly provides that no member of the legislature shall be liable in any civil or criminal action whatsoever for words spoken in debate. We didn't give that privilege to ourselves. That demand is enthrust upon us by the people of Nebraska who wrote and adopted this constitution. And it has to mean something. And it's there to provide guardrails at times of the most significant challenge. Accountability and responsibility are different than punishment. There can and there should be accountability and responsibility for what happens on this floor and beyond, but there cannot and there should not be punishment for speech. And that extends not only to the issue that we have before us in the short term, but the substantive matters that are working their way through our various committees and that will be debated on this floor. At every instance, and when it's particularly a close call, our constitution, our values, our principles require us to come down on the side of free expression, not on the side of punishment. For librarians, for members of the legislature, for people involved in peaceful free expression, no matter how hard or distasteful or offensive it may seem to the listener or the audience. 
Over the last 12 hours, I, like many of you, have received dozens if not hundreds of calls and emails and texts um, and social media messages about what happened here last night. It is our job to take into consideration the voices of the members of our second house, but it is our job to temper the toxicity in our politics, to take down the temperature, not turn it up, to not react to the apoplectic nature of social media, and to make sure that we as individuals and as a collective lead forward appropriately. We should not weaponize the tools that we have available to us in our criminal code or in our rule book for political or partisan reasons, whether the challenging conduct or speech comes from a point on the right or the left of the political spectrum. This is what it means when we say, I don't support what you're saying but I support your right to say it. Everyone understands what that means as Americans. It's critical to the values that we hold dear, protecting speech, protecting academic freedom, protecting free expression. So now when those values are most tested is when we have to rise above party differences, above petty differences, above personal differences, and we have to lead by example, and we have to lead forward. I am asking members today to proceed in a thoughtful way, a measured way, to have robust discussion as they see fit, but to push back clearly and strongly against any punishment available to us for free expression, no matter how painful or offensive we may find it personally. That is what the law requires. That is the oath that we, up, that we took to uphold our state and federal constitutions. <laughs> and I am grateful for your time, consideration, and attention. And I thank you for listening today. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Conrad. Mr. Clerk, you have an item on the desk. Mr. President, there's a motion on the desk. Senator DeBoer would move to overrule the speaker's agenda pursuant to rule one, section 16A. Mr. Speaker, you are recognized. We will take that motion up at this time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Senator DeBoer, you're recognized to open on your motion. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, colleagues. This seemed like the, this motion is a debatable motion. So it seemed like a good way to preserve our ability to discuss the budget for four hours when we get to that, should we choose to, and yet have the opportunity for folks to speak on the issue which Senator Conrad and Senator Arch raised before you. So I have filed this motion and we have the ability to speak about it. And what I would ask of you colleagues is that I think that we will, we've all had a judgment in our mind about the event last night. And that um, what I would ask you to do is to listen. Because in most situations, we can learn something from listening to each other. What happened last night was not okay. It wasn't. It was inappropriate. It was hurtful. It was not okay. I've known Senator Halloran over these last six years, and I do not think that that represents who he is. I 
I hope Senator Halloran will listen to the folks who are upset about the incident last night, and I, I hope he will apologize. What many folks may be wondering about or thinking about right now is why we're taking the time to talk about this. It may seem to some like, oh, we shouldn't spend our time talking about this or this is, this is much ado about nothing, but that is not true. If you have not been in the situation to experience harassment, sexual violence, you maybe don't understand the ways in which those memories um, can be triggered. And when describing the reading from the transcript and then inserting a senator's name in there, already that's a problem. But the additional, I think it was meant to be perhaps some sort of maybe a gotcha moment or a, a moment of something. Uh, but there was aggression in it and, and that's where the danger lies. And I, five years ago, I think it was, I stood up in this chamber when Senator Chambers made a comment about a member in this body that I also believe went beyond the pale. And in that day and in that incident, I also stood up to support the senator who I thought should not have been treated in that way. And so I stand up in support of Senator Michaela Kavanaugh and honestly also Senator John Kavanaugh and Senator Dungan. I agree with Senator Conrad that free speech includes speech we do not like, which we find abhorrent. I also think that as human beings and as people of integrity, we should stand up and call out that speech. And another little point I'll make, I was disappointed to see people laughing when Senator Michaela Kavanaugh was discussing this issue last night. And to the extent that some of you found it funny to see another colleague in pain, I would ask you to do better. I would ask us all to do better than to neglect the human beings that are in this very tough job with you. And that includes those who do things which we do not like. I do not ask 
those senators who were impacted. I, I don't ask them to accept an apology, to move on, to any of those things, because that, that is not the appropriate thing to ask for. That is not okay. People get to feel how they feel. And we should take them seriously. I, I don't have the right words. I don't have the right words. I don't know who thought I would. <laughs> We've got to be careful with each other because we are all human beings who deserve respect. We are all human beings who do not deserve the aggression. I'm, I'm messing this all up. I'm not saying the right things, but um, but I call it I, uh, I hope we will listen to each other today. I hope we will listen to each other today because I do think this matters. I, I, I do think how we interact with each other in here matters. And I also don't think anybody should be thrown away. That is my policy when we're debating criminal justice. And it is my policy today. I hope that folks work one minute to regain the trust, though it will be hard. I hope we all take this seriously. I hope we don't laugh. I'm sorry I didn't do this justice. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator DeBoer. Turning to the queue, Senator Blood, you're recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. President, fellow senators, and still friends all. I stand now to speak about the victims, the survivors, the people who don't have a voice on this floor today. And I have to disagree partially with Senator Conrad because actions do have consequences. And yes, you do have the right to free speech, but just like we don't yell fire in a movie theater, we don't wantonly use words that refer to rape and insert a senator's name and expect there to be no consequences. People always say that words count. And by the way, it would be great if we had more senators that were turning around listening to people instead of looking down. This is a great time to engage with other senators. I believe that it's that not only do words count, but it's what we don't say that really counts. And like it or not, friends, what happened yesterday trivialized sexual assault. I don't believe that was his intent, but that was the consequences of his actions. What was done yesterday, again, whether it was the purpose or not, marginalized not only Senator Kavanaugh, but every victim, every survivor, and makes it harder for them now to come forward when they have issues like this. And you've heard this on the floor. There are women here who have been violated, violently violated, who continue to move forward, continue to deal with those issues, some better than others. But until you have experienced that violence, until you have experienced that loss of power, that victimization, I really feel like your compassion should maybe be a little better, should be maybe more compassionate when it comes to these senators and the words that we use on these floors, this floor. Yesterday, what was said literally reinforced what abusers, abusers have always said, that it's the victim's fault. 
And again, not the intent, but the consequence of the words. And so I speak out on behalf of the victims, on behalf of the, sur the survivors, many that I'm sure have contacted you, people who were calling me in the middle of the night crying about their loved ones who watched it and were in despair. That should not happen when you watch a legislative session. But that was the consequence of those actions. We have to hold others accountable for their actions, and we have to insist that there be respect in this space when it comes to issues like this. When we look at the bills this year, we've talked about obscenity and trafficking, sexual assault, pedophiles, child abuse. But yesterday showed that there are certain members of the body that are only concerned about the parts that they are particularly offended by. And I think that that's been the issue with many of the debates that we've had. We have got to be aware of the words that we use especially when it comes to things that pertain to something so personal as sexual assault, as rape. What happened yesterday wasn't about the book that they want to ban. Because if it was, a Kavanaugh name would not have been inserted into that. It was about stirring things up, being disrespectful. And like it or not, it was about re-victimizing a victim. And that's not going to go away. And I do hope, regardless of what the purpose was, that there is some guilt today that Senator Halloran is feeling because his actions created a world of hurt for hundreds, if not thousands, of Nebraska women, and I'm guessing men as well, but I've only heard from the women because men tend not to share their stories because they feel embarrassed about it because guys aren't supposed to be raped. Actions have consequences, and the consequences are that we hurt a lot of good people with that few minutes of speech, regardless of whether it is free speech or not, Senator Conrad, and that we cannot do that on the floor of the Nebraska legislature. That's your Thank time. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Blood. Senator McDonald would like to recommend a group of Serve Nebraska AmeriCorps members from across the state in the North Balcony. Please rise and be recognized by your Nebraska legislature. Senator Halloran, you are recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I have an apology to make, and I'm, I'm not gonna make the apology to take the load off my shoulders in the way I presented what I presented yesterday, but I apologize for interjecting the Senator's names in the middle of reading a transcription, transcribed testimony in a public hearing in reference to a book that is in some schools and in some schools required reading. It was a hard thing to read. And no, I was not trivializing rape. I was reading from a book that's required reading for some students. Should I have interjected the senator's names? No. Sometimes we do things on the floor in the midst of making a statement that we shouldn't have done. I think once the transcribers transcribe what was said yesterday, you will see that prior to my speaking, um, Senator John Cavanaugh and Senator Dungan uh, spoke uh, in terms of the constitutionality of the issue, and I respect them both. They are very very intelligent attorneys and they do understand the Constitution and we all respect the Constitution. But that being said, once the transcribers have transcribed what I said, I think you'll notice that I first referenced Senator John Kavanaugh. Should I have done that? Maybe not. But what I was trying to do was get their attention, get their attention to what I was reading from this book. 
you know, senators on the floor, people do speak, and Senator Blood will point this out from time to time, and she's correct. Sometimes we don't give attention to who is on the mic and who's speaking on whatever issue it might be. We should be doing that. We're all guilty of not doing that. I understand that. I'm guilty of it. But in the middle of my reading of that very harsh description that was in the book, again, required reading for some students, in the middle of that reading of that, uh, it was clear to me that some people were not paying attention, and so I called their name out, and I shouldn't have. It was, it was a mistake to do that. But underlying what the reason for my doing that was, I think it's important. We, we spoke in broad generalities about books that are in libraries, books that are required reading for some students. We spoke in broad generalities, and the public really wasn't aware of what is in some of those books. I read, read an excerpt from the book Lucky. Lucky is a story about a young woman's experience, horrible experience, being raped, I think 18 years old. She was raped by an individual who, as the story was, was, was written, was raped by an individual who had previously raped several other women and killed them. And the title of the book was Lucky because she felt lucky that she survived. She felt lucky that she survived. So I understand the context of what I read from that book. But regardless, if you reread that, if you reread that, it's on the record, both in the committee and what I said yesterday. If you reread that, one minute, if you reread that, it is a, a lesson on how to rape. That's what we should be outraged about. It was a blow-by-blow -blow lesson on how to rape a woman. That's where the outrage should be. Not in my pointing it out that it's in a book. In, in regard to freedom of speech and banning books and all this language that gets bannered about, I think it's a matter of good judgment for schools to pick books that are okay for kids to read. And if parents want to buy these books and give them to their children, that's, that's their li liberty to do that. So again, I apologize to Senator Michaela Cavanaugh. If you read the transcription once they're written, I think you will note, note, note that the transcription I first ad addressed Senator John Cavanaugh. That's your time, Senator. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Halloran. Senator Slama, you're recognized to speak. I, uh, I took a decent amount of time trying to figure out what I would uh, say today. Um, but my brain just kept going back to every spring break, so around this time every year, um, there's always a few little girls that come to the Capitol, and it's wonderful. Like, they're excited about politics, and they say, and it's crazy, like, y'all can laugh at this if you want, that they want to be me when they grow up. It's wild. It is such a privilege for me to be a young woman on the floor and to be that person that they can look to. It's also horrible on days like today because we fail them so constantly here. We, we can debate about who should be able to access books with graphic depictions of rape. Kids shouldn't be exposed to it, in my opinion. But this isn't about the books. This stopped being about LB441 when we started bringing up rape and interjecting a Kavanaugh's name into a graphic de description of rape. Those comments were wholly inappropriate, and I'm beside myself at the tone that's been set for this morning that somehow we have this underlying current of we need to let this go because there's more important things for us to be talking about. I don't care if it was John Kavanaugh. I don't care if it was Michaela Kavanaugh. 
It doesn't matter the gender of the person you are trying to sexually harass. This isn't new. Like, we can't get up here. Senator Arch even admitted, this isn't new. Senator DeBoer referenced it in her comments. Senator Chambers got up in 2020 and talked about enslaving and raping me and claimed that I owed my political career to favors of the flesh. There wasn't a formal response then, and I can't change that. For years, I've fought behind the scenes, trying to get the executive board to take action on any form of an HR structure to protect staff and to protect my colleagues from predatory senators. Right now, there are three actions that can be taken by the legislature on this occasion. A formal letter from the executive board, a censure from the legislature, which has no impact other than being a vote taken to condemn the action, and expulsion from the legislature. There is nothing else. And I'm still the only woman on a nine-member executive board tasked with being the HR arm of the entire legislative branch. I can't change that either. But what I can control is how I choose to respond to this situation when one of my other colleagues has been targeted. Now, whether that is Michaela Kavanaugh or John Kavanaugh, it doesn't matter. It's one of your colleagues. If you were at your job, any other job, any other job in the world, and you got up and told your coworker in front of the entire rest of the workplace, give me a blowjob. And you got up and you said that. And then you interjected their name into a graphic description of a rape. What do you think your company would do to you? Do you think you would have your job the next day? I'm almost more fired up about this when it's not me, because like my instinct, as every woman's is, when something like this happens, is to minimize it immediately. And to go, yeah, well, you know, it wasn't that bad, and if I make a big deal of it, okay, cool, now it's not me anymore. Now it's someone else. Next year, it'll be somebody else. And we'll still be navel gazing and going, well, gosh, you One know, minute. thank you, Mr. President. We, we can't have an HR policy because this place is special. This place is special because it's the one place in the state of Nebraska where you can get up and talk about raping a colleague and not have any professional consequences. We have to do better. We can't just let this go. We owe it to the little girls who are watching at home, wanting to be something like this when they grow up. We owe it to every Nebraskan because we're the most public workplace in this state and we deserve for it to be a professional workplace. Senator Halloran, you should be ashamed of yourself for being incapable of apologizing. There is no justification for your actions and you should resign. Thank you, Senator Slama. Senator John Kavanaugh, you're recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I wasn't actually planning to talk. Um, and I appreciate Senator Slama's comments. But I guess since, like a lot of things, when you don't intend to be part of a conversation, but you don't get to choose whether or not you're the target or subject of sexual assault, you don't get to choose whether you're the target or subject of uh, some sort of, I guess, political maligning for grandstanding purposes. Um, Senator Halloran, I, I guess I, I don't know what to say to what you said yesterday, but I would say, again, you missed the point. You're saying that you owe me an apology for inserting me accidentally into this uh, sentence. You're missing the harm that that action caused to everyone else around us. Senator Salam, I couldn't say it better than you, so I won't even try. But th the actions have consequences. Yes, our speech is protected in here, and our speech is protected everywhere, honestly, but they still have consequences. And sometimes those consequences are the harm that your speech causes. Now you wanna rely on the fact that what you were reading is a transcript of a book that you're saying is taught in schools. And you did correctly point out that this is a book about 
an individual who had, who was raped at the age of 18 uh, and had traumatic results of that. What you are missing is the value of her sharing her story and the value that people derive from reading that story. And what you did in this conversation about obscenity and prurient interests is took a story and inserted your colleagues into it for effect, which in itself you created a new work, one that is far more prurient than the original content you were discussing because you in essence, sexualized the people you work with for some effect. And that's what we're talking about. The protected speech and the value derived from these books that you don't like is that they have other context and surrounding value to people as a whole. The value of reading about somebody's traumatic experience to someone who went through a traumatic experience is that it helps them cope. It helps them move on. It helps those of us who have not experienced a traumatic experience to empathize with them. So of course I would suggest to you, read that whole book. Read the rest of it. Find out what is the value there. Because you're not deriving empathy from the paragraphs that you've read. You are deriving some sort of other value for you. And I, I'm, I'm not going to suggest what it is, but it does tread close to the prurient. So just, I appreciate everyone's comments. Senator Blood, I don't want to leave you out. You said some really good things I did write down. I did have my head down, Senator Blood. I apologize, but I was taking notes. Um, but one of the things that, one minute. thank you, Mr. President, inspired me to stand up was, I think Senator Blood said it, men often don't come forward. And I'm, don't feel bad for me. But I don't want you to think that I'm ashamed of what's happening here. I'm proud of the work we do. I'm proud of the work that I do, and I'm proud of the stances I take. And Senator Halloran, I will stand up and fight for your right to exercise your freedom of speech, even when it is offensive to me and my friends and family. So I hope that we can all move on, but I hope we've all have actually taken an opportunity to learn what is and is not obscene and what is the value of learning about people, other people's experience. So thank you, fellow colleagues, and thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator John Kavanaugh. Senator Michaela Kavanaugh, you are recognized to speak. I actually would like a point of personal privilege. Please state your point. Thank you. I was going to take a point of personal privilege earlier, but I was a little overwhelmed by the tone policing that was happening by my colleagues. So I had to take a step away. I love you, Senator John Kavanaugh. You are an amazing example of what a man should be, of what a father should be, of what a brother should be. And I am so privileged to serve in this body with you. It is an honor. I had written remarks that I was going to say this morning, but they no longer feel right or appropriate. I believe in the freedom of speech, and I know that the speech on this floor is protected speech, but it is misguided to think that there is a same thing between appropriate speech 
and protected speech. Yes, it's protected, but no, it is not appropriate. And no, it should not be tolerated. And to Senator Slama's point, we should have some mechanism to address inappropriate speech. But we don't, and we have failed ourselves, and we have failed Nebraska in that point. I am so sorry to all of the people who have been harmed by the discussion last night, both inside this body, men and women, and outside of this body. It was not appropriate, and it was not who we are. And it is clearly not something we should tolerate. I want to be careful with what I say because I see some students up in the balcony. Hi. Some fourth graders. We're having a debate about First Amendment freedom of speech. We're having a little bit of a disagreement over that, but this actually is a lot about you all and, and school and education. What's appropriate versus freedom of speech? There's a lot of things that people can say that are covered under freedom of speech, but they probably shouldn't say them in front of you. So I'm not gonna say any of them in front of you today. I hope that we will move forward with the seriousness of this body and the seriousness that Nebraska deserves. I'm fine. I went home last night and I got to snuggle with my snug -and -ug, my middle child. She was still awake when I got home and she wanted me to lay in bed with her until she fell asleep. So I did. And I stroked her hair and I rubbed her back and I kind of hummed to her, and it was wonderful. I'm fine. I'm hurt, I'm upset, but at the end of the day, I'm fine. I have a full life. I get to work with my brother, who's an amazing human being. And I have colleagues who are willing to stand up and defend me and defend this body and defend the public. So I'm fine. I will say that yes, what we say here is protected speech, but what we say off the mic, that's different. And yesterday before the dinner break, Senator Halloran came up to myself and Senator Walls and started telling us what was in that passage that he read into the microphone. He started describing it to us. So when he says that this wasn't directed at me, even though he did invoke my name at the start of his remarks before he invoked my brother's name, and then he dropped the first name, when he says it wasn't directed at me, I don't believe him. Not that it matters, because as my brother said, Men are victims of sexual violence, just like women are. And it is not appropriate. But it is also not appropriate to walk up to two of your female colleagues and start describing a rape scene right before the dinner break, off of the mic. So, do with that what you will. Thank you so much to Senator Slama for continuing to stand up. I know it's not easy. I know people have not believed you all of the time. But you are an amazing advocate for victims. And your voice is so important. So thank you. And I... We'll end there. Thank you. 
Thank you, Senator Kavanaugh. Senator Kathleen Kauth would like to recommend 40 fourth grade students from Ackerman Elementary in Omaha in the South Balcony. Please rise and be recognized by your Nebraska legislature. Senator Meyer would like to recognize 20 students from Central Valley, Central Valley High School and two teachers in the North Balcony. Please stand and be recognized by your Nebraska legislature. Returning to the queue, Senator Von Gillern, you're recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. President. I really didn't want to be on the mic this morning, but I can't sit quietly. And I think the balance of male to female comments this morning is a little bit out of whack. And I think it's appropriate that as a man, I stand and say what I believe all men should say and what they should believe. And as someone who is seen in the body, and rightfully so, as someone who's right-leaning, it might feel a little, little bit odd to hear some of these comments, but I'll say them, and I'll try and say them with as much grace as I can, knowing that there are fourth graders in the room. Senator John Kavanaugh mentioned that men are assaulted also, and that is true, and men are impacted by sexual assault. I'm grateful that that's never happened to me personally, but it's happened to two family members. And with apologies for sharing a story that isn't completely mine, I'll just say that being the father of a rape victim is a very hard thing. And uh, maybe it's PTSD, I don't know, but when you hear a story that brings back personal memories and, and hard memories. It doesn't matter what your gender is. If somebody told a story about something horrible that happened and the victim's name was Brad, and they repeated the name Brad over and over and over again in that horrible story. I don't know that I could help but flinch every time I heard my name, whether it was directed at me or not. So I struggle with the, and it's inconvenient, and it's a challenge, and sometimes we've all confused the two Senators Kavanaugh in the room uh, in our in our own testimonies, but be that as it may, I know I could not help but take it personally. When our kids were little and we taught them about apologies and forgiveness, one of the things that we taught them is that the word but can never be in an apology. It makes it a conditional apology. And while Senator Halloran, I believe that you meant no harm, I believe that with all my heart, that you meant no personal harm to anyone, a conditional apology is still not a full apology. I encourage you to continue to search your heart, and I hope that your perspective on this changes to some degree. And I hope and pray that anyone who is negatively impacted by what was said finds healing over that. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Von Gillern. Seeing no one else in the queue, Senator DeBoer, you're welcome to close on your motion. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I just wanna make sure it was abundantly clear that I stand with Senators Kavanaugh's, the, bo both Senators Kavanaugh and Senator Dungan in saying this should not have happened. It is not okay. 
It is not acceptable. Senator Haller and I also ask you to do better in your apology. Senator Slama is right, these things happen here. They happen here more than you think. Someone this morning says, it doesn't happen where I'm from, it does. If you don't know it, that's why we have these discussions is because it does. I've been a lot of places in my life, it's happened everywhere I've been. If you think the underlying stories don't happen where you've been, they do. We should be something that the state of Nebraska is proud of. I don't think they can be proud of us after yesterday. I think we all have a duty to earn the respect of the state of Nebraska again. Mm -hmm. I was on the committee with Senator Slama that was working on trying to figure out how we handle these situations and it is difficult and I will take responsibility for being, I, I should have done more to make that happen. And I'll try to in the future. I thank you all for listening that did and for taking this seriously. Um, this is serious. It's very serious. It's serious because it matters not just to the people in this room, but to the people outside of this room for whom we are supposed to be leaders we are supposed to be examples. Yeah. We are all human. So we will fail at that. And when we do, we just need to do better. So we need to do better. I will, I commit right now, I will do better. I will try harder. I will try to find a way to make sure that we do better. Mr. President, I would like to withdraw my motion. So ordered. Mr. Clerk for items. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, your Committee on Revenue, chaired by Senator Linehan, reports LB 350 to general file, LB 937 with committee amendments. Senator Linehan uh, has amendments to be filed to LB 1317. Senator Vargas has amendments to be filed to LB 1355, and Senator Kauth um, has LR 331. Uh, it'll be uh, read and laid over. That's all I have, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. We will now proceed to the first item on the agenda. Mr. President, select file, LB 1413, I have uh, ENR amendments. Senator Ballard for a motion. Mr. President, I move the ENR amendments to LB 1413 be adopted. Colleagues, you've heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. Opposed say nay. They are adopted. Mr. Clerk, next item. Senator Clements, I have floor amendment 256. I have a note that you wish to withdraw it and substitute AM 3071. There's been an objection to withdraw with substitute. Senator Clements, for what purpose do you rise? Um, I've moved to withdraw FA 256 and substitute AM 3071. 
Senator Clements, you are recognized to open on your motion. Thank you, Mr. President. This is um, LB 1413 is one of two budget bills and the uh, the LB fourteen thirteen is the cash funds transfer bill. LB fourteen twelve follows this, but I wanted to start with the cash fund transfers. And I had a handout that was handed out to you earlier. It has both LB fourteen and LB thirteen on the uh, handout. And it shows in the far right column which bill we're talking about. And we're talking about LB 1413, which is the cash fund transfer. You think of the cash fund transfer, especially our cash reserve, is like your savings account. If you're going to buy a car and you've saved up $10,000 in your savings account, you transfer from your savings account to your checking account, and then you write the check. The general fund, which is 1412, is the checking account. We're talking about uh, basically savings accounts here. Item one on the handout says uh, there are three lines for item one. The state unemployment cash fund, uh, I guess I'll preface this with, there were a number of uh, objections and questions about some of the funds transfers, and I've met with uh, the speaker, several senators, uh, governor's staff, and um, have come to an agreement with those, uh, as far as I know, that this is an agreeable overall solution to uh, do some changes to the budget that aren't real major, but at least are going to address some questions. So, the uh, first one, the state unemployment fund transfer was proposed to be $70 million, and there still will be $70 million transferred, but the first line shows $40 million uh, reduction to that transfer, and the second line is going to transfer that to a new Department of Labor cash fund called the Workforce Development Program Cash Fund, and so $40 million of the 70 we're going to earmark. So the Department of Labor is going to be spending that for employment and job related functions so that it does, it would have otherwise just gone to the general fund, be spent on all of the general expenses, but $40 million will be uh, just allocated to the Department of Labor. So that's lines one and two on the spreadsheet. Then you go down to item number three is the next item in this bill. Behavior health reduced the transfer. The behavior health transfer was on page 58 of the governor's gold book. It was going to be, let's see. It was proposed to be $15 million. This will re reduce that by $2 million. It was going to reduce the fund balance to 1.1 million. This restores 2 million, will remaining, have remaining balance of $3.1 million. That fund also gets $4.5 million a year from documentary tax, so it does have revenue coming in the future. Line four is, and I am, uh, Senators who brought forward some of these requests, I hope they will get on the microphone and discuss them. Next one is a tenant assistance using the Attorney General Settlement Fund, a $500,000 allocation there. Item five is Madonna in Lincoln um, had, it does have still a 500000 Five million dollar ARPA allocation. It was proposed to remove ten million dollars of that. You'll see a seven million dollar item there. So it's going to end up that Madonna will have five million dollars of ARPA funds and three million dollars of cash reserve funds. And I've been told that they're expecting 
$7.8 million from the new hospital assessment fund, which will be every year. So those numbers add up to over $15 million is what they had actually originally had in our budget. And so I believe that's restoring them with different pieces to what they had in the original, uh, the proposed budget. Line six, the York prison water system repair. Corrections said that two and a half million is needed to um, repair the York women's prison. And uh, that's line six. We're going, that will be a cash reserve transfer. That's a new item. Line seven, Special Olympics. There's a, an amendment proposed for Special Olympics. This an amendment would transfer $500 from the cash reserve for Special Olympics programs. Then you go down to line 10 is the last item in LB 1413's amendment 3071 uh, for tribal water system. It doesn't allocate dollars, but it gives an intent to prioritize any tribal water system that has has a federal do not drink order, and we do have a tribal system that has a do not drink order, and we're um, authorizing the Water Sustainability Fund grant to be an, an intention to prioritize a system that is in that situation. Then down at the bottom, you see a tourism fund transfer that has already been accomplished. It's not in this amendment. We did that the other day where there was $5 million coming out of the visitor fund, and we, we reversed that. That's not in today's amendment, but I just wanted to point that out so that you'll see that the bottom line, all of these, both of these uh, bills, the amendments will, will reduce the general fund by $7 million. It will reduce some cash funds, $23.5 million, but the cash reserve will increase by $4 million uh, once we get both of these bills. And I welcome people to speak about individual items that they had requested here and uh, welcome questions. If you have any, please let me know. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Clements. Moving to the queue, you are also next in the queue, Senator Clements. You're recognized to speak. On the objection. And so I, um, I wave. I've, I've said enough for now. I'll be back later. Thank you, Senator Clements. Senator Wishart, you're welcome. Recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. President. It's good to see you up there. Uh, I rise in support of uh, the amendments and the underlying bill and want to speak specifically to a couple of items that um, the chair went over, but I want to go in a little more detail. Uh, one that I had mentioned early on, and it's an issue that I want to thank Senator Raybould for bringing and Senator Brewer as well for championing over the years, um, our tribal water systems in particular, in the Santee Sioux for the Santee Sioux Nation um, are in disrepair. Um, in terms of the Santee Sioux Nation, they're under a do not drink restriction because the quality of their water is so damaged. And we've had a lot of conversations over the years with how we can manage this and I am excited to announce that included in this amendment is a prioritization of tribal water in our water sustainability fund. So if you look at the amendment uh, AM3071 on page three, you'll see language uh, inserted that the commission, this is the commission that oversees the water sustainability fund, when ranking and storing applications for funding, we'll prioritize projects for drinking water improvements for any federalized rec federally recognized Indian tribe whose drinking water is under a non-drink order from the United States Environmental Protection Agency. We anticipate there's about 20 million additional dollars in that fund, and so my hope is that um, in applying, if the, if the tribes choose to apply for this funding, that, that their funding needs will be prioritized. 
Another area I want to focus in on this amendment is funding for the York prison water system. I know uh, Senator McKinney is, is coming up and, and he and Senator Wayne are, are two that brought this issue to our appropriation committee's attention. Um, it is my understanding that they have significant water challenges at that women's prison that are long overdue. And so I am glad that we're prioritizing that in this budget, in this amendment. I know Senator Dungan is also, oh, he got off. So I will talk a little bit about the court interpreters. I'm glad to see in this amendment that we are earmarking and prioritizing 600,000 in investment to our Supreme Court interpreters. This was one of the more compelling hearings that we had in appropriations committee. Uh, it is vital that in people having access to justice, they're able to communicate with each other. And so I'm glad to see that this amendment is also prioritizing that. And then I'm glad to see that my friend and colleague, uh, Senator Danielle Conrad, she brought a very important bill in terms of tenant assistant. It's assistance in helping to ensure people are not evicted and that we're finding solutions that that don't lead to people um, being unsheltered. And so I'm glad to see that we're putting and in investing some dollars into the sort of legal support that goes into making sure that people have housing justice. So that's included in this amendment as well. And so I'm, I'm really proud of the work that we've done to listen to some of the members of the body as this budget came to the floor and try and address some of the issues that, that we heard. And that's why I will be wholeheartedly supportive this amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Wisher. Senator McDonald announces the following guests who are visiting the legislature, seven members of the Men of God Bible Study from Omaha under the South Balcony. Please rise and be recognized by your Nebraska legislature. Mr. Clerk, for a motion. Mr. President, Senator Mikhail Kavanaugh would move to Bracket, LB 1413 until April 18th, 2024. Senator Michaela Kavanaugh, you are recognized to open on your motion. Thank you, Mr. President, <laughs> colleagues. I feel a little bit like a is it a yo-yo? Just kind of this topic and this topic. I During uh, the height of the pandemic, when we were all uh, sheltering at home, I, a friend described it to me. When you are trying to educate your kids and work and just be in your house all together, uh, and you're going from thing to thing to thing, the constant context switching. And I was like, that is what being in the legislature is. It's just a series of context switching. So I'm, you know, kind of like a yo-yo on context today. Um, so forgive me if it takes me a few minutes to get my own brain up to speed on what's going on. So I put this motion up because genuinely, I didn't know what was in this amendment and I didn't want to allow the amendment to just go up without having some clear understanding. Um, so I, of course, am going to ask Senator Clements to yield to a question. Senator Clements, will you yield? Senator Clements, Michaela Kavanaugh is asking you to yield. Yes. Thank you, Senator Clements. Welcome back to our lively debate. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, so this amendment, I was listening as you were introducing it, and you passed out a chart. And there's some things on here that um, I guess I have questions about how these decisions were made. So let's start with the 40 million unemployment fund. Why, what is the change there? There was going to be all 70 million transfer was just going to the general fund to be spent. And I had a request, had meetings with several senators that brought issues and um, 
a proposal was made to separate $40 million that only Department of Labor will use to, uh, because Department of Labor and the budget people said they, they could spend $10 million a year for four years out of, this, out of a new workforce development program. And so the, there was an objection to just taking unemployment dollars and just spending them in general funds. This will allocate them for workers and jobs in Department of Labor. Um, and uh, they, that was the amount that I uh, was told that Department of Labor has uh, use of in so, the future. So this 40 million is in addition to the 70 million? No, it's part of the 70 okay. million. It's, it's taking the 70, 40 million of that 70 and moving it over. So is, it, is that 40 million funding things that were part of the intention, intended budget already, or is this a, an additional expense? This we're... will be future uh, items that the Department of Labor programs you know, that they will spend money on. And, and they, there may be some of the items they would have spent general funds. This will allow them to spend this cash fund with um, earmarked so, dollars for out of the unemployment fund. So is this, if we adopt this, is this going to change the balance of available funds on general file for the floor? Well, that's uh, no, because it is actually replacing $40 million that we would have spent, for, that the Department of Labor would have spent general funds. Now they're going to spend cash funds. And so okay. if you look at the third line down, there's a, under general funds, there's a plus 40 million. So, but it's over the next four years, see fiscal year 24, five, six, and seven. Um, uh, okay. And we, we work with a four year period of time. So we're saying that it's going to save 40 million of general funds by using that cash. Okay, and then the Medicaid excess profit fund, what is what is the change here? There was a request by the agency to, with, to transfer $38 million in the committee. We passed over that and we, uh, we're going to wait and come back to that because there are bills that we have to spend that. There is, and I, I passed out a handout in committee, I failed to get back and address that. There are bills using that fund in the amount of about $5 million. And I checked with, it's, so we're, we're reducing the $38 million transfer to $30 million, leaving $8 million for bills out of that fund, which currently there are $5 million worth. And so, that is, Health and Human Services especially need, needs that money for the Medicaid recertification, unwind, and the handout I gave you, there is at least 60 more million dollars they've had in uh, what they call federal unfunded mandates that they're funding. Why, why is it costing them so much to do the unwind? Could you repeat that? I'm not able to hear why? very well. <laughs> Why is it costing them so much to do the unwind? The unwind is just evaluating people who qualify for Medicaid or, and deciding if they qualify or they don't qualify. So why is it costing them so much more than just running the Medicaid program? That's uh, above my pay grade. That's, <laughs> Did they just... give any reasoning when they made the request for either the 60 million or the 30 million, 38 million? The handout um, talked about a $30 million cost, another $32 million, and a $13 million in addition to the unwind. So it's, uh, it's helping uh, them with uh, additional general fund unexpected costs. So is the unexpected cost the drop in the FMAP? Yes, that's part. Of, that's one of the items. That's the second one. Okay. But, okay. Um, and then why the behavioral health transfer? It sounded like you were reducing it, but not reducing it. There is a transfer, but um, there was a request not to reduce it so much. 
So this is restoring $2 million to that, uh, that fund. The transfer was taking the balance down to 1.1 million. This, is, this will bring it back up to 3.1 million ending balance, plus they get four and a half million a year of revenue from documentary tax. That was the uh, request to uh, not reduce the fund so low. Okay, and why are we reducing the tenant assistance fund by 500,000? Oh, that's the negative number. Sees we're spending cash. We're going to fund that okay. from the state settlement fund. Okay. The negative number means we're spending money. And then we're taking the Madonna reverse appropriation. What does this mean? The, uh, the appropriate the committee amendment put ten million dollars for of cash reserve and five million dollars of ARPA funds for Madonna's. HVAC system. The um, let's see here. The so we're then, cutting we're cutting that down to we're, we're going to remove the ten million. I was originally going to be do, doing that, but it's now now they're going to get three million and five million. The, okay. We're, we are removing seven million of the ten million that was allocated. Okay. Which is going to help fund these other items that people wanted. And One then minute. we're adding into this the York Prison System Water and the Special Olympics pro program. Yes, we're those are the additional expenses and the uh, you know the, the Madonna funds is covering and the those. PTSD pilot program. That's ARPA funds, but but we're yeah, adding that in. Yes. That's so then in. what's but then are we taking five hundred thousand from the Department of Transportation? Yes, the committee had every, all the ARPA that wasn't allocated was in the committee amendment, it was about $20 million to, it was going to the roads fund and to fund the PTSD program, we're just reducing the roads operations, 500,000. And then I don't see any money for the tribal water system. Well, possibly Senator Wisher could speak to that, but it's a, we didn't have a dollar amount, so it's. The, That's your time, Senator. Uh -huh. Thank you, I'll come back with more questions. Senator Walls would like to announce the following guests that are visiting the legislature, 11 fourth grade students from Trinity Lutheran in Fremont in the North Balcony. Please rise to be recognized by your Nebraska legislature. Senator Jacobson, you're recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I think I got part of my questions answered. I, I do have a quick question for uh, Senator uh, Clements, if he would yield to a question. Senator Clements, will you yield? Yes. Well, Senator Clements, I, I know we discussed this a little bit yesterday, and I guess seeing it in front of me again this morning, I just want to clarify a couple of things. So. Uh, my understanding and having some conversations with Senator Hansen, so the Department of Labor Fund, which is really that state unemployment fund, and so as people know, there we the, the currently employers pay into the federal unemployment fund and the state unemployment fund. A portion of what they pay into the federal fund goes to the state fund, and it's accumulated to about $7.8 million. And so we're going to take uh, 40 million and move it into a new fund that would be for job uh, training, which is what the interest on that fund has been used for up to now. And then 30 million is going to go uh, and stay in, into the general fund. So that's going to leave us with about roughly eight million dollars in the fund. Is that correct? Uh, Twelve million. Twelve million. All right. Even better. So. I, I guess the question is, what do you see the plans to be from there for that 12 million and for those employers that are still paying into that state fund? Uh, are we looking to try to eliminate that going forward? Yes, the, if you read the statute, the director on December 1st has the ability to change the rate of tax on that fund every December 1st. And it looks like the body would like for him to change it to zero, or the body could do that in a bill, but it would be next year. And I think my conversation with Senator Hanson, I think we're currently at a statutory minimum, so next year we'd have to bring, or we need to 
do something to let Senator, let uh, the director basically take that to zero so we quit building that state fund, correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, the other question, I guess, has to do with the behavioral health transfer. If I'm not mistaken, there was $15 million of, of that fund that was being taken out, and now there's $2 million being restored back into it. That's right. That was a request by someone interested in that, and they said they would uh, be more comfortable with that transfer if we would restore $2 million because it was taking the balance down to $1 million. This will leave it a little over $3 million. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Senator Clements. Uh, I, I guess I would just say that I, I continue to have concerns about the behavioral health transfer. I'm, I'm going to uh, vote in favor of the, of the bill because I think everything that we do here results in compromise, and I think it's a good compromise. I think the, uh, I think the uh, committee has done a good job of listening to constituents and listening to the body, and I think have come up with a reasonable plan here. Uh, so I, I am going to move. I am going to vote in favor. However, I do believe that behavioral health still is a huge pro problem for us in this state, and I think we need to continue to be proactive in getting DHHS to be a little more responsive in terms of funding the health districts and allowing them to continue to take care of. Uh, patients and people within the state of Nebraska. So uh, that's one I'm going to want to watch in the future. Uh, and because uh, I know that this is something that is important to my constituents and it's a problem that seems to uh, never go away. In fact, I believe is continuing to get worse. So I'm concerned about removing funding from that. But I do believe that overall, this is a good compromise with the dollars that are available. And so I'm going to support uh, this bill. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Jacobson. Senator McKinney, you are recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I rise in support of the bracket motion, mainly because I'm looking at this thing that was handed out, and I don't see any adjustments for the housing that I brought up last week. I do have an amendment to address that. That is AM 3069, because as I stated last week, there is inequity in housing funding in the rural workforce housing and the middle income workforce housing. There is a gap of, if we go with what we're, what is proposed in the budget, there will be a gap of 42.3 million between the two funds, which is complete inequity. So what I'm proposing is that we just evenly divide the money out. If there's $25 million for housing, let's just give $12.5 million to rural and give $12.5 million to middle-income workforce housing. I think that is fair. It'll still be inequity in the funding, but at least we split it in half this year and we can figure it out next year. But that's my problem with this proposal of whatever this floor amendment is. Nobody has addressed that piece of this. We got up today and talked about doing better, caring about the people of Nebraska and being fair and thinking about them and, you know, stumping out inequities in this state. And this proposal doesn't do it at all, you know? So I brought AM 3069 because if we're, dev if we're devoting $25 million to housing, I think it should be evenly divided. I think that is nothing but fair when you look at the numbers and you clearly see that if we give $20 million to rural workforce housing and only five to middle income workforce housing, there will be a $42.3 million gap between the funds since 2017. Federal dollars are federal dollars. I'm not bringing that up. I'm talking about middle income workforce housing and, and rural workforce housing. I'm not even talking about the affordable housing trust fund. Those are three different funds, but between rural workforce housing and middle income workforce housing, there's a gap and it's very, and it's completely inequitable. All I'm asking is that the body supports evenly dividing the funds. I think that is fair. And this is honestly, it's not a hostile amendment. It's not, I'm, I'm really not trying to take a bunch of time on this. I'm just trying to say, hey, guys, let's slow down. Let's amend this to make sure we 
have some fairness in this and then let's, you know, we could address these other issues. I'll, I'm glad to see that there's a willingness to provide some support for uh, York water system repair because women in York deserve clean water. And it shouldn't matter that they're imprisoned in York. They deserve clean water because they're human and we should take care of them. We talk a lot about the Nebraska State Penitentiary, but there's problems in York, in York as well, which is why I think with the $350 million, we should have just repaired the, the, the places that we have in York, NSP, and there's other issues at other places. But you wanted to build a new prison, and I'm not gonna argue that. But anyway, all I'm asking is support from the body to evenly divide the housing funding. I think that is fair, especially when it's clear that if we give 20 million to rural workforce housing, there will be a $42.3 million gap. Nobody in here can stand up and tell me that is fair and equitable. So all I'm asking is, let's be fair. Let's have some equity in this place. I know for some people, equity is a word that shouldn't be used, but let's have some equity and funding. And with that, I'll yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you, Senator McKinney. Senator Dover, you're recognized to speak. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to, first of all, thank uh, Chairman Clements for working with um, various senators in our body um, and uh, to address their concerns and those uh, not being a list of all of them, but those senators including Fredrickson, Conrad, Wishart, Wishart Brewer, Wayne, Dungan, Van Gilleren, and McKinney, I think he did an exceptional job. Uh, working with them in, in my understanding of trying to find some middle ground uh, to move this budget forward and, and address some of the concerns that some of those centers may have felt was not uh, addressed in the previous budget. And so I would stand in support of the motion 1272 to withdraw and substitute amendment 3071. Thank you, I yield the rest of my time to the chair. Thank you, Senator Dover. Senator Michaela Cavanaugh, you're recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. President. Would Senator Clements yield to a question? Senator Clements, will you yield? Yes. Thank you. Okay, where we last left off in our <laughs> duo, our dialogue, we were talking about the tribal water system, and you said that we couldn't, there wasn't a specific amount. And I'm just curious, how is that going to work if we don't? I do. I have that. Um, that is section seven of the amendment. If I can get to that. Um, it's the, the commission, which is the water sustainability fund, shall, when ranking and scoring applications for funding, prioritize projects for drinking water improvements for any federally recognized tribe whose drinking water is under a no-drink order. And that uh, from the U.S. EPA. And so that... So is there that's a on fund? page three of the amendment. Is there a fund? Yeah, I see that page three, lines 11 through 15. So is this coming out of a... A fund that already has money? Yes, yeah, the Water Sustainability Fund. It, okay. It's, um, it gets $11 million a year added to it, and it has more than that. Now I don't know the exact balance. Okay. So the water, we, won't making, we would not be making it unsustainable if we uh, start a grant program for it. There are those uses for it, but um, the commission then we'll prioritize, but we're trying to give them the in intent here to make this a high priority. Okay, okay, um, thank you. I appreciate that very much. Um, now, to Senator McKinney's uh, um, comments on the housing, there's nothing in here creating any sort of parity about between the rural and urban housing uh, delineations. And so he's put an amendment on. Is that something that would be supported? Or why was it not included in this amendment? In discussions that I had, it wasn't brought up. And um, I am aware that he has that amendment. 
uh, the committee allocated the funds differently. I'll, I intend to uh, support the committee decision on that one. But you're changing how you allocate these other funds because that, that was brought up. I, I guess Senator McKinney and I brought this up on the floor when we first debated this. I don't know what conversations happened off the mic, but we were not included in any conversations and we predominantly spoke on the bill. The vote of the body will decide that then. Okay. Well then who was a part of the conversations that led you to some changes? Senator Wayne, Senator Conrad, Senator Wishart, Speaker, the Governor's Budget Office, myself. Um, well, I know Senator, Senator Wayne Renahan. and Senator Conrad both had the housing on their list of important issues. Uh, there were, uh, yeah, there were a lot of issues brought up. Not all of them ended up in this amendment, and um, the people can that didn't have something in this amendment can uh, file who, amendments. Who wanted to cut the funding for the Mad Madonna then? Um, well, there was a concern about one facility that has losses from Medicaid patients uh, being singled out and, and getting cash reserve funds and nobody else getting that. Um, so I think that, that was, but that was also for CEDAR. People have the same concern about funding CEDAR with $5 million. And I don't see Cedar having a reduction here, just Madonna. And Cedar's was ARPA funds, uh, and Madonna's still getting ARPA funds. But they were um, getting an you know, additional $10 million of cash reserve funds. But we're taking uh, ARPA funds from the roads in order to fund the Madonna. Why are we not taking it from Cedar? That was $2 million that Cedar is allocated. That was a committee decision. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I think we're about out of time. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Kavanaugh. Senator Erdman, you're recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate it. And good morning. So we're talking about uh, 14, 13 this morning, we've had numerous conversations about the transfer of these funds. Uh, and as you know, we talked pretty extensively about the unemployment fund last week. And so Senator Clements has worked with those who were in opposition to what we were doing and come up with this solution. But I was wondering if Senator Clements would yield a question. Senator Clements, will you yield? Well, Senator Clements. Yes. Senator Clements, I'm, I'm going to come straight forward with this. Uh, you and I had a conversation about the $10 million that is being uh, taken back on Madonna. And you explained to me that they're getting $5 million of ARPA money plus uh, the hospital incentive of $8 million. Is that correct? I was told by their lobbyists $7.8 million, yes, every year. Okay, so, so basically we've taken... We've taken this back, but we're going to replace that with other funds, so they're not they're going to be held, well, I would call it harmless in a way. Yeah, the five million plus three million of cash reserve is eight million, plus we anticipate their system will get almost eight million more. It would be fifteen point eight million dollars uh, in the first year and then seven point eight in the future years. Okay. All right, thank you for answering that. I appreciate that. We need to be concerned about those 89 people that Madonna takes care of and, and uh, has in their care. And, and I think we have done that in this transfer, and I think that this proposal that Senator Clements has worked out, and, and those of you who helped him do that, is, I'm very appreciative of that. I think it's an opportunity for us to move this yeah. transfer, 1413, uh, and then we'll move on to 1412 and we'll accomplish that one as well. But I stand against the bracket motion and I would appreciate the fact that uh, you'd vote red on the bracket and vote in favor of the amendments and 1413. Thank you. 
Thank you, Senator Erdman and Senator Clements. Senator Michaela Kavanaugh, you're recognized to speak, and this is your third time on the motion. Thank you. My second time in a close, right? You have this time in your close left. Thank you. Okay. So, 1413. I, I have, uh, clearly, I have concerns over the budget. Um, more heavily weighted to 1412, which is the actual transfer of cash from cash funds. Um, it's reckless. It's reckless to raid cash funds for one-time padding of the budget. And we are putting money towards things, and I, I'm trying to gain an understanding of the thinking behind it, but so many of the things that I've asked on this budget, the response has been the governor asked for it. That's not really a good enough answer. I mean, yes, the governor asked for it. I suppose he presented us with a budget. <laughs> uh, so of course he asked for it, but, but why? Why is it necessary and does it align with the priorities of what we as a governing body, a deliberative body, are trying to achieve? And when I ask those why questions, I'm not really getting any answers. And we're going into a lot of cash funds that do important things that were created by previous legislatures to do important things. And we are disregarding the reasons that they were created. And I am sorry, but telling me that the governor asked for it is not persuasive enough for me to say, oh, okay, well then I'm going to vote for that. I'm going to vote for historic sweeping of cash funds for one-time transfer because the governor asked for it. And when times are good, that's not when you raid the piggy bank. We need to be forward thinking. We need to think about what our financial solvency is going to be in 2027, because all of the projections are bad. They're bad. So are we going to raid all of our money now and in 2027, where will we be? Now, some of you may have moved, I don't know, to Florida, Arizona, warmer climates by then, but I intend to be here <laughs> raising my family and I won't be in the legislature in 2027. I would like to know that I left this place better than I found it and I don't think that this budget is going to lead us down that path. But we are making changes and I do appreciate the willingness to discuss changes. I just don't understand how these decisions were made when the people who were standing here in opposition to this bill repeatedly laying out our very substantive concerns were not at all informed of One what minute. you decided was a compromise. It's not a compromise when you exclude the opposition. It's just you deciding something else in isolation. So what are we doing? And just handing us this and saying, and submitting an amendment and saying, this is it, take it or leave it. That's also not how compromise works. I would like to have a conversation about housing. I would like to address housing in this state. The governor vetoed it last year for rural. 
you all chose not to override it, and now you are raiding the urban fund. And you won't even discuss or entertain parity. Time, Senator. Thank you. Senator Dover, you're recognized to speak. Thank you. I just want to address uh, some of the concerns that uh, Senator Kavanaugh had. And um, just to, I jotted just a few things down here. I'll be brief. Um, one thing I just I brought up a little earlier, um, as you said, um, the decisions were made in isolation. I just, and I just actually wanted to, and as I spoke up earlier, I commented with Chairman Clements working with uh, Senators Fredrickson, uh, Dungan, uh, Wishart, uh, Brewer, McKinney. I mean, I don't know that I get all that I want. I know, well, I'll tell you, no, I know I haven't. Um, but we do kind of work together. But I, but I would say that uh, I don't believe the decisions were made in isolation. We also, I, was, I would also say that we have um, appropriations committee that uh, Senator Vargas, Wishart, McDonald sit on along, along with uh, a number of other of us. And we have a uh, robust uh, discussion. And we do not go in and raid um, and without uh, discussion and really the responsibility of making sure we maintain a budget that will fund our state into the future uh, securely. Uh, we sit down with the um, assistance of Director Patent and the fiscal office. So this is not any uh, random or not thought out process, we make sure that there was adequate funding moving forward. Again, this is a one time, uh, I guess, reach in and take out money that, that has been sitting there for many, many years. And I'll say this, uh, this money is not our money. This is the taxpayer's money and it's been sitting there uh, in these accounts for years, and, and in many cases, there's surpluses. The surplus was created because they couldn't fill positions and they had adequate PSL, and they couldn't fill the positions, and the surplus built up. And I would say this is, what should we do with that surplus? We should, uh, excuse me? We should give that money back to the people, and that's exactly what we're doing. This this money that we are building up is to be to front load property tax uh, reform. And in many cases, I speak to property tax really briefly. Is but there are people who are paying more in property tax than they did in their house payment. So I really believe we owe it to the people to get that money back. Uh, in their pockets and not our pockets to sit there idly, and I'll say idly sit there in an account of, in some cases, $70 million sitting there that hasn't been used for 30 years and only money used was interest. So um, I believe decisions weren't made in isolation. I believe that the Appropriations Committee did their due diligence in researching. We did not take any more. In some cases, we actually reduced what the governor was asking to take because we felt that we should leave some of those monies in there that maybe there was uh, too much that was being considered to be taken to, to give back to the people. And um, I guess I'll just yield the rest of my time to the chair. Thank you. While the legislature is in session and capable of transacting business, I propose to sign and do hereby sign LR 318. See no one in the queue. Senator Kavanaugh, you're welcome to close on your bracket motion. Thank you, Mr. President. So, I remain in opposition to LB 1413. I'm disappointed in how this amendment came to be as it clearly excluded the voices of dissent in the formation of this budget. I am relieved that the women's prison is going to have water. I am relieved that the tribal water system is finally going to have grants to be addressed because they don't have drinkable water. These are bare necessities that should have been a top priority and not negotiable for any of us. We should have prioritized above all these other things, making sure that the residents of the state of Nebraska 
have water. Because even housing is not as important as actually having water. So good job on that one. Not asking questions of why the agency needs so much money for the Medicaid unwind is not doing due diligence. The Medicaid unwind is just a fancy term for evaluating if people should be on Medicaid or not which is the job of Medicaid to evaluate on a regular basis if people should be on Medicaid or not. If the unwind is costing so much more money than just doing their job regularly would cost, then perhaps that is a place that we should be looking at. What are they doing? Fortunately, we are requiring a report from them if we pass my bill. So maybe we will have an idea for those that are curious where the black hole of money to DHHS goes, maybe we will have an idea. I don't even understand the Madonna thing because people opposed giving money to Madonna and Cedar. So I'm not really sure what just reducing the amount of money, who that appeases at all. So, you know, like if you're going to give them the money, give them the money or don't give them the money, but reducing it doesn't make any sense to me. I don't even know what the PTSD pilot program is. I'm assuming that maybe it's Senator Wayne's bill from last year. Yeah. Okay. So that makes sense. And that's using ARPA funds, which also makes sense because Let's face it, our kids were traumatized through uh, COVID. The Supreme Court interpreters earmark 600,000. I guess, well, that's good because we don't want to lose the interpreters. But this amendment, it doesn't feel genuine. One minute. We need to be addressing in a substantive way developmental disability funding, behavioral health funding, all the Medicaid programs that we have, not just the unwind where we're kicking people off of Medicaid, and housing, housing, housing. Whether you think it's the job of the state or not to provide housing for Nebraskans, people need housing. People are, have housing insecurity and we need to do something about it. We can approach it from a million different ways, but we still need to do something about it. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like a call of the House. There has been a request to place the House under call. The question is, shall the House go under call? All those in favor, vote aye. All those opposed, vote nay. Record, Mr. Clerk. 18 nays, two nays to put the House under call, Mr. President. The House is under call. Senators, please record your presence. Those unexcused senators outside the chamber, please return to the chamber and record your presence. All unauthorized personnel, please leave the floor. The House is under call.
All unexcused members are now present. The question before the body is to bracket the bill until April 18th, 2024. All those in favor, vote aye. All those opposed, vote nay. Record, Mr. Clerk. Four A's, 37 nays, Mr. President. On the motion to bracket, Mr. President. The motion is not successful. I raise the call. Mr. Clerk, next item. Mr. President, I have a priority motion. Michaela Cavanaugh would move to recommit the bill to the Appropriations Committee. Senator Cavanaugh, you're recognized to open on your motion. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, you know, I am just uh, tired. That's my opening and my close. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cavanaugh. Seeing no one in the queue, Senator Kavanaugh was recognized to close and she waves closing. Question for the body is to recommit to committee. All those in vote, favor, vote aye. All those opposed, vote nay. Mr. Clerk, please record. Four A's, 33 nays, Mr. President, to recommit the bill to committee. The motion is not successful. Turning to the motion to withdraw and substitute. Seeing no one in the queue, Senator Clements, you are recognized to close. Thank you, Mr. President. This motion to withdraw and substitute will be um, getting us to, uh, as for your green vote, that will get us to AM 3071, which is what we've been discussing, which are the um, amendments, adjustments to the cash reserve and cash fund budget bill 1413. I ask for your green vote on motion 1272. Thank you, Mr. President. You've heard the close. The question before the body is the withdrawal and substitution for the committee amendment. All those in favor, favor vote aye. All those opposed, vote nay. Mr. Clerk, please record. Thirty-seven A's, one nay on the motion to withdraw and substitute. The motion is successful. Senator Clements, you are now recognized to open on AM 3071. Thank you, Mr. President. AM 3071 is an amendment to LB 1413, which is the cash fund transfer and cash reserve allocation bill. And that is on the budget appropriation bill handout I gave you, and we've already been through a number of those items. The um, 
a question about the item two, Medicaid Managed Care Organization Excess Profit Fund um, being used for re redoing Medicaid eligibility. There are over 350,000 people on Medicaid, uh, I believe, and I'm, my understanding is that we have to recertify, making sure they all are eligible and we don't have 350,000 people in HHS. They're working hard to do that. And so I think a large amount of the $30 million allocation is going to be used for that purpose. And what isn't used, um, the other handout I gave you was showing some other new expenses that Health and Human Services has. And this uh, transfer of this fund will allow the use of cash funds rather than general funds, which would uh, reduce money to the floor and reduce our um, budget, um, increase our expenses. And the, um, on the behavioral health program, um, I was given a handout about fiscal year 2023 that they had new appropriations of $68.8 million, carried over $35 million for a total of $104 million in behavior health aid program. And um, their expenditures were $67.8 million still leaving 36.6 million unspent in behavioral health aid. And so we're, we're not trying to eliminate or cripple behavioral health programs. Uh, the uh, analysis of those programs showed that there were funds that, that were not being used like a lot of the other cash funds. Everyone was an, analyzed to make sure we weren't taking uh, so much away that they couldn't perform their annual uh, uses and spend their money. So I uh, still do stand behind the transfers that were made and I think that they were done with a thorough analysis of those funds. The, uh, so the AM 3071 would enact the items that are marked in the bill column 1413, and I uh, ask for your green vote on AM 3071. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Clements. Seeing no one in the queue, Senator Clements, you are welcome to close. Any waves? The question before the body is the adoption of Amendment 3071. All those in favor, vote aye. All those opposed, vote nay. Mr. Clerk, record. 35 A's, no nays on the adoption of the amendment, Mr. President. The amendment is adopted. Mr. Clerk, for items. Mr. President, Senator Clements would move to amend AM 2698 uh, to, 14, to LB 1413 to strike section one. Senator Clements, you are recognized to open on the amendment. That was a placeholder amendment. I move to withdraw. So, so ordered. Mr. President, Senator Clements would move to amend with FA 257. Senator Clements, you're recognized to open. That was a placeholder amendment and moved to withdraw. So ordered. Mr. 
Mr. President, I have FA 287 from Senator Jacobson with a note that he would wish to withdraw. So ordered. Mr. President, Senator McKinney, McKinney would move to amend with AM 26, excuse me, with uh, Amendment 3069. Senator McKinney, you're recognized to open on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Again, as I mentioned earlier, I brought AM 3069 to even out the funding for housing. When I looked at the numbers for the rural workforce housing and the middle income workforce housing, and, calc and I got the calculations if we were to just give 20 to the rural income workforce housing and only five to the middle income workforce housing, there would be a difference of 42.3 million between the funds, which is inequitable. So all I'm asking is in this amendment is just even it out. So if we have 25 million for housing, give 12.5 million to rural, and give 12.5 million to middle. I think that is fair. I don't think that's a big ask. I'm not asking for extra dollars. All I'm asking for is fairness in the dollars that we allocate in our budget. I was disappointed to see that when this sheet was handed out, those adjustments weren't in this sheet. So I brought the amendment. Well, actually, I brought the amendment just in case this didn't happen because me just being overly cautious and sort of, you know, kind of not skeptical or paranoid, but I brought the amendment just in case what I thought wasn't going to happen happened. So all I'm asking is a green vote to support AM 3069 to even out the funding for both funds. I think that is fair. Now, if somebody can explain to me that having a $42.3 million gap between two funds that are, that are devoted to housing is equitable, I'll listen to the argument. I will. I actually do listen on this floor, and I listen to every word everybody says because I like to learn and I like to, you know, make my arguments after you make your statements. So all I'm asking is that. You, everybody in the body votes green to even out the funding for the rural workforce housing and the middle income workforce housing to take 12.5 for rural and 12.5 for middle. I think that is a simple request. It shouldn't be that big of an ask, especially considering the inequity in funding between the two. Thank you. Thank you, Senator McKinney. Turning to the queue, Senator Jacobson, you're recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, well, I appreciate uh, Senator McKinney's comments and the spirit in which he brought the amendment. Um, I am opposed to the amendment, however, and I would argue that if we're gonna split dollars equally between Omaha, Lincoln, and the rest of the state, I'm game. Let's bring all the dollars that went to Omaha split it in half, move half up to rural Nebraska, I'll sit down, let's move forward. But it doesn't work that way. Okay, the committee had thoughtfully agreed to give $25 million to rural workforce housing. That has since been reduced by $5 million to 20 million and 5 million, and that's what the, that, that's what the recommendation has been. And I'm gonna support the committee in their recommendation. Now, some would ask why does rural workforce housing Workforce housing need 20 million. I would say they don't need 20 million. They probably need 100 million. But we'll take the 20 to fund what's available coming from the budget. Why does the need so dire in, in rural Nebraska? Well, first of all, let me be clear, having financed a number of lenders over the years, in rural Nebraska, we have a lower household income than Lincoln and Omaha and in Grand Island. When you go to rural Nebraska, income, household incomes are lower. Because they're lower, you can't afford as much home. I would also argue when it comes to building housing in rural Nebraska, we don't have all the subs. So a lot of those subs, a lot of the general contractors that come to rural Nebraska to build homes are gonna have higher costs and they're gonna pass those costs through. 
I would also argue that the cost to get materials to rural Nebraska is higher because of location. So the committee looked at all those factors when they made the re recommendations that they did. I'm supportive of the 20 million and the 5 million. I'm not supportive of doing more than that. And so I would urge a red vote on this committee amendment and support the committee as been as LB 1413 as previously amended so that we can move on. But I would oppose AM 3069. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Jacobson. Senator Wayne, you're recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. President. And I'm okay with going game. Let's start, let's go even farther and say where the money's collected should stay in the area it's collected. Because I think Omaha and Lincoln produce a little over two, they're actually more than two thirds of our sales tax. So I'm game if we want to go urban versus rural. I don't think people want to take me up on that challenge because $600 million going to a canal is, is rural. So we, we can have that conversation. But here's the facts about housing. Housing was passed because of my vote. Senator Stenner, Senator Williams brought this bill. It was, a, it was being filibustered. Rural already got a $30 million jump start. We brought a bill the following year for middle-income housing. It was first filibustered, and then we had to bring it back and attach it to another bill. And ever since then, there's always been a $30 million gap because you had a $30 million head start. But I think moving forward, it should be equitable. It should be parity when you talk about rural and urban housing. Now, there are other things that are very specific that we can always have to deal with, like the canal, like Fort Robinson, thinking of bills that I did, like inland ports, like all those things. There is going to be a slight edge to, to rural, but on housing, we say it's a statewide issue. It's the top three issue across the entire state. That isn't just a rural issue, it's both. So I think moving forward, at least that was, and I'm gonna talk about the promise that was mentioned on the floor in these transcripts, if you go back and read, going forward when we passed the middle income housing, it was Speaker Shear, Senator Stinner, Senator Williams, myself, Senator Linehan, we were all in a back room, because if you recall, there was some delays going on because of the, we couldn't get middle income housing passed that we were gonna be equitable moving forward. Now it hasn't always been, there'll be 5 million here or some ARPA dollars here, but even in ARPA, we went 20 to Omaha for housing, 10 to Lincoln and 10 to rural. We tried to break it up equitably. I don't think this amendment is going that far. I think it's in the spirit of what we all promised here on the floor going when dealing with housing, we're gonna to try to treat it fairly across the state. And it's been the past practice of this body to try to treat it fairly across the state. That's all I think this amendment does. That's why I'm support this amendment. This is something this body committed to over and over and over again. It's our, been in our budget, it's reflected that. Again, it hasn't been 100% parity, but it sure hasn't been a $20 million swing except for the initial one, which was rural workforce housing. And if you'll recall, I'll just, that's where Extremely Blighted came from because we negotiated that in to get the, get the bill passed. Otherwise, it, if rural workforce housing wouldn't even exist. And the next year we came back with middle income housing. Senator Vargas's bill was filibustered. And then we attached it to my bill after negotiations. And we put, I think, 20 million in, in addition, another 20 million at that year to rural for, workforce housing. So you guys are always gonna have a $30 million head start. But moving forward, why not just keep it equal? Nobody's trying to say, make up for the initial 30 million. We're just saying, moving forward, keep it equal. I think that is reasonable, well thought out compromise that we have been abiding to for the last three years. I don't think we need to change it now. And if we do, my fear is that's gonna creep into everywhere else. Everywhere else, where we start this urban or rural divide that I think we've been consciously trying to avoid. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Wayne. Senator Erdman, you're recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. President. I was uh, a little surprised by Senator Wayne saying the canal was for 
uh, western Nebraska for rural because him being a fish whisperer, I would think that he would know that water flows downhill. And so when water comes in the western part of the state, it will eventually wind up in Omaha and Lincoln. So the canal is not necessarily just for rural or western Nebraska, it's for Nebraska. You'll also notice that in Senator Wayne's comments, when he said those senators that help pass workforce, middle income, rural housing, he never mentioned my name as being one of those supporters. Because if I had my way, Senator McKinney, if I had my way, I'd take the $25 million and put it back in the general fund. Because I'm still trying to figure out where it is written in the Constitution that we should build one house. The government should not build any houses. That's for the private sector to do. So I did vote for that transfer and I will vote for it again. But I think building workforce housing, middle income, affordable, whatever you want to call it, is for someone else to do besides the government. Anyway. There's going to be a new housing development in Gearing, Nebraska, by a corporation from Kansas, nonprofit, who figured out what Jake Hoppy has figured out for years is that he can milk the system and he can get low income housing, work, rural workforce housing money. He get gap money that pays a difference between what it costs to build a house and what he sells it for. Then he will get TIF financing so he can collect the taxes for 20 years. And then he will get a 9% reduction in his federal income tax. So I'm disappointed that they got ahead of me because I think that's what I want to do when I get done with these last 14 days. Most of these people or a significant number that are in this construction business to build housing are lawyers because they're the ones that have figured out all the loopholes and the advantages to low, middle, and affordable income housing. And they've been taking advantage of it. And so the reason that it's not economically feasible to build a house, that costs too much, and the bankers aren't willing to finance those people because it's too risky, and so they let the government finance them because it's okay if the government loses money but not their bank. And so if I were in the banking business, I would want to have low income, middle income, and affordable housing so I didn't have to take the risk. Because then those people that buy that house have to finance it somewhere, and they very well could be in their bank. And so I'm in favor of 1413, and I'm opposed to 3069. And I, if I could, I would take all the money out of workforce, affordable, and middle income housing and put it back in the general fund that's where it that's where it belongs. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Erdman. Senator Dover, you're recognized to speak. Thank you. I just like to bring up a couple talking points, and I and I think uh, being from uh, Greater Nebraska, I'd like some people may not be aware of this, but basically the rural communities. Um, I don't know if really necessarily rural communities, but those communities besides Lincoln, Omaha. Um, I believe have experienced um, a great challenge in locating vendors uh, to do the jobs and, and therefore if you look at the number of units built in Omaha and Lincoln versus uh, communities across Nebraska like my community of Norfolk, Kearney, Grand Island, I can go on North Platte, uh, you'll see a significant uh, number if you if you actually compare it to the population as a percentage of population then you'll see in Lincoln and Omaha. <clears throat> and so I'll say this that so rural has has not was not building the number of houses when Omaha and Lincoln were. It wasn't anybody's fault. It's just they're just they started out behind, and so there definitely needs to be a catch up done, and I think this funding will help to do that. Um, I, think, I also think that. Um, if you look at the imbalance, so if you simply look at Omaha and say, well, you know, Omaha needs the same amount, have the same, or Lincoln needs the same amount as Greater Nebraska, that's that's really, is it really fair? Because what they're not looking at is, is a metro has so much 
has so much more availability to funds on the federal level. Omaha can request millions and millions and millions of dollars that we can in Norfolk, and I don't even know that they can in Lincoln. And so there is a huge amount of money that we're not even discussing that is pouring into Omaha that we can't access. So I think really comparing a metro city funding uh, to uh, greater Nebraska really is isn't a fair comparison because we are not even discussing the millions and millions of dollars that they can apply from the federal government simply because of their population size that we do not have access to in uh, Norfolk and Greater Nebraska. Thank you. I yield the rest of my time to the chair. Thank you, Senator Dover. Senator McKinney, you're recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. President. Conversation has been great. I would like to say that yes there is housing issues across the state yes there's issues with income and balance but one fact has been true my whole life i represent the poorest district in the state and that's been that way for my lifetime and probably before i was born we have housing affordability problems in my district 70% or more of my district is renters, not homeowners. So yes, this is why, it's partly why I'm supporting this because I believe in home ownership. And I believe that everybody, no matter where you at, deserves the right to home ownership. We've committed dollars to, to things I don't think we should have committed to in this legislature since I've been here. And a lot of it has not Yes, we got investments from economic recovery, but compared to where other dollars went, it's not even equitable, but I'm not gonna start there today, but it is what it is. I'm not asking for extra money. All I'm asking is that we evenly divide the resources that we have for housing this year. As Senator Wayne stated, rural workforce housing had a head start of $30 million. And then we talk about Omaha being able to request dollars and grants and these things like that. The issue is, one, the state of Nebraska does not ha have a housing agency. We don't even have a committee completely committed to housing in the legislature. There are, there are many federal grants that the state of Nebraska could go after, not just in Omaha. But because we don't have a housing agency, we don't go after those dollars or we miss out on those opportunities. And I could go on all day about the billions of dollars we miss out every year because we don't have a grants department in DC. But I'm not gonna go there. All I'm asking is for your green vote to evenly divide this money. We could go on all day and I'm not trying to have a rural urban divide conversation because it's not about a divide. It is about making sure that we evenly divide the resources we have this year in this body to urban, not urban, to middle income workforce housing and rural workforce housing. That is the only ask. And Senator Urban, the genie is already out the bottle for dollars going to housing. All I'm asking is for equity. We we already the the genie's out the bottle. We're already funding affordable housing and other projects across the state, so we can't take that back. But we can do what's right going forward and commit equi commit to having a balance of resources going to both places. That's all I'm asking. Nothing else. Nothing extra. I don't want to go have tick tick for tap with everybody in here. I'm just saying. Let's evenly divide the, the resources because I could go all day about some of the comments that were made on the mic about median incomes and disparities all day because my district probably ranks the worst in all of them. But I'll leave it there and I'll just ask for your green vote. Thank you. Thank you, Senator McKinney. Senator Wayne, you recognize to speak. Thank you, Mr. President and colleagues. I just want to kind of, so for those who think this is just about Omaha, it's not. Lincoln also gets middle income housing. And I want to actually talk to Sarpy County senators 
Sarpy County Senators, Senator McKinney has a, a committee priority bill today, 840, that will allow Sarpy County and Senator Bosselman and Senator uh, Clemens District uh, right outside of Lincoln and Waverly to now qualify for middle income housing grants. So when you think of that, you're talking the three big counties, not just within the cities, but also uh, Cass County and, um, yes, yeah, RP County and Link Lancaster County. So this is not truly urban versus rural. And as far as the lack of grants, one, you, people assume Omaha can go after a lot of federal grants. I will tell you a kind of a misnomer here. It's hard to go after federal grants when the state of Nebraska is not a partner in those grants. It's very hard to coordinate grants for the state of Nebraska. If you don't believe me, I can hand out two maps where we are the only state in this area that is white. What I mean by that is, is there's blue, yellow, and other colors around us for grants and designations at the federal level that they got and Nebraska either didn't apply or they didn't correctly apply, or lastly, they didn't have the enough, uh, their application didn't have the merit to uh, deem uh, uh, get an award. The point of it is, is we do miss out on billions of dollars. And a lot of these workforce housing can go into Norfolk, Hastings, South Sioux City, where there are census tracts that qualify, we just don't go after them. But what we do have control over is the ability to be equitable when dividing our resources. Housing is a concern. It's a concern across the state. If we start going through this budget line by line and go rural versus urban, rural versus urban, we'll be here all day and it won't be productive. But we're talking about one issue, one issue in particular, that will create some parity between urban, rural, and those who are caught in between in the suburbs uh, as far as housing. Of getting affordable housing. I don't know how much more clear we should be as a body that this is important, and it's not just an important issue for the rural Nebraska, it's an important issue for all of Nebraska. So I would ask you to support AM 3069. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Wayne. Senator Iba, you are recognized to speak. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I just wanted to chime in and mention that um, last year my priority bill was Senator Breezy's uh, 249 that spoke to uh, workforce housing. That bill would have allocated 11, or 10 million to rural and 10 million to middle. And after lots of discussion, um, it went through, but then the governor vetoed it. I think this bill is an attempt to kind of replenish that r rural uh, need. As a matter of fact, I'm going down next Friday to Imperial to visit with them. They're doing a, a ribbon cutting. And I think that the rural folks have made a very, very good attempt at accommodating uh, their needs and, and their ability to pay for those. I would just um, ask for your support for uh, the rural workforce housing piece of this um, and yield my time back. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Ibaugh. Seeing no one else in the queue, Senator McKinney, you are recognized to close on your amendment. Thank you. I'll be short, last year, Senator Ibox Bill 249 had an even split, as she mentioned, 10 million for rural and 10 million for middle income. And that's all I'm asking is an even split between the funds and I ask for your green vote. Thank you. Thank you, Senator McKinney. The question before the body is the adoption of Amendment 3069. All those in favor, vote aye. All those opposed, vote nay. There's been a request for a roll call vote. Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. There's been a request to place the House under call. The question is, shall the House go under call? All those in favor, vote aye. All those opposed, vote nay.
Mr. Clerk, please record. 26 A's, four nays to go place to the House under call, Mr. President. The House is under call. Senators, please record your presence. Those unexcused senators outside the chamber, please return to the chamber and record your presence. All unauthorized personnel, please leave the floor. The House is under call. Senator McDonald, please check in. Senators Bostar and Slama, please return to the chamber. The House is under call. Senator Slama, please return to the chamber. The House is under call. Senator McKinney, Senator Slama is missing. How would you like to proceed? We can proceed. Senator McKinney has allowed us to proceed. There has been a request for a roll call vote in the reverse order, Mr. Clerk. The question before the body is the adoption of AM 3069. Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. Senator Wishart. Voting yes. Voting yes. Senator Wayne. Yes. Voting yes. Senator Walls, yes. voting yes. Senator Von Gilleran, yes. voting yes. Senator Vargas, excuse me. Senator Slama, okay. Senator Sanders, voting yes. Senator Reapy, voting yes. Senator Merman, voting no. Senator Mosier, voting no. Senator Meyer, voting no. Senator McKinney, voting yes. Senator McDonald, voting yes. Senator Lowe, voting no. Senator Lippincott, voting no. Senator Linehan. Senator Kauf. Senator Kauf. Yes. 
Senator Jacobson? No. Voting no. Senator Eibach? No. Voting no. Yes. Okay, yeah. okay. Senator Eibach. No. 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 Okay. Senator Hunt. Voting yes. Senator Hughes. No. Voting no. Senator Holdcroft. No. Voting no. Senator Hardin. No. Voting no. Senator Hansen. Voting yes. Senator Halloran. Voting no. Senator Fredrickson. Voting yes. Senator Erdman. Voting no. Senator Dungan. Voting yes. Senator Dorn. Oh. Senator Dover. Voting no. Senator Dorn. Voting no. Senator DeKay. Voting no. Senator DeBoer. Voting yes. Senator Day, voting yes. Senator Conrad. Senator Clements. Okay, voting no. Senator Michaela Cavanaugh. Voting yes. Senator John Cavanaugh. Voting yes. Senator Brewer. Voting yes. Senator Brandt. Voting no. Senator Bosselman. No. Voting no. Senator Bostar. Yes. Voting yes. Senator Bosman. No. Voting no. Senator Blood. Okay. Senator Ballard. Yes. Voting yes. Senator Armaderas. Voting no. Senator Arch. Yes. Voting yes. <clears throat> Senator Albright. Voting yes. Senator Aguilar. Voting no. no that's okay. Senator Wayne changing from yes, yes to yes. not okay. voting. And let's fix. Mr. Clerk, please record. Yep, 23, A's, 23 A's, 21 nays on the adoption of the amendment, Mr. President. The amendment is not successful. I raise the call. Mr. Clerk, for a motion. Mr. President, Senator Wayne would move to reconsider the vote just taken. Senator Wayne, you're recognized to open. Thank you, Mr. President. I will be brief, colleagues. I'm just looking for one vote. Um, let me explain again. Senator McKinney has a bill right now that is on the agenda that opens up middle-income housing to Waverly, Sarpy County, outside of Bellevue. The new development that we just put sewers in, Mr. Senator Holcroft, will be available for grants in Sarpy County. This also applies to Lincoln, so Lincoln senators, Omaha senators, Waverly senators, Sarpy County senators, please look at that vote card again and understand what we're doing. We are bringing parity between rural and urban to make sure that we are trying to attack affordable housing throughout the entire state. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Wayne. Turning now to the queue, Senator Jacobson, you're recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, just want to remind everyone again, there was a hearing, committee had, had discussions, committee made a recommendation, recommendation was $25 million to rural workforce housing. There was a compromise to move $5 million to middle income workforce housing, and they agreed to that, and that's what they brought to the floor. Now, if we're gonna go piece by piece and dissect the budget and decide what's rural and what's urban, let's go. Or we can honor the committee's recommendation and move forward. We could talk all day about all the dollars that flow to Omaha, flow to metro areas, all the grants that are available, all the money that flows there regardless. But we're not, we don't need to do that. 
we're talking about seven and a half million dollars. That's what we're talking about. And we're basically saying that rural Nebraska doesn't need that. And I believe we do. And I believe the committee considered that when they made the recommendation. So I would encourage everyone to not make this a rural urban divide issue, honor the committee's recommendation, and vote no on this amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Jacobson. Senator Armandiras has guests, 12 fourth grade students from the Legacy School in Omaha in the North Balcony. Please rise and be recognized by your Nebraska legislature. Mr. Clerk for items. Thank you, Mr. President. I uh, have a notice of committee hearing from the General Affairs Committee, and I have a Motion from Senator Hansen to recess the body until 1.30 p.m. You've heard the motion. All those in favor, vote aye. All those opposed, say nay. The legislature is on recess.